Welcome to the Startup of the Year podcast, where each episode we showcase exciting new companies from around the world. This podcast is produced by Established, creators of the Startup of the Year program. Established is focused on helping organizations with their innovation, startup, and communication strategies. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Startup of the Year podcast. Happy New Year! I'm Frank Gruber, your host today, and I hope you had a wonderful and safe holiday season. I know I sure did. On this episode of the podcast, we're going to hear an interview with Rich Malloy, our VP of Engagement at Establish. He's going to be talking to Aaron Frug. Aaron is the co-founder and CEO of Griffin, which is a cool new fintech app that makes investing as energizing as buying your morning coffee. And uh, it basically allows any users to invest a dollar in every company where you spend money. So, for example, if you were going to get that that cup of coffee at say let's say Starbucks or maybe Dunkin' Donuts, uh, place an order. You in the you know the app actually picks up that order on the back end and instantly invests one dollar into let's say Starbucks or whatever um, publicly traded company you've just bought something from. So pretty cool stuff. Um, Griffin was our People's Choice Award winner at the Start of the Year Summit last fall. And uh, I know a lot of our team was pretty excited about it. They, you know, a lot of us downloaded it and we've been using the app. And I'm currently looking at my dashboard and I have lots of Amazon stock now. Well, actually not a lot of it, but $50 worth because I must have made 50 purchases <laughs> in Amazon over the last couple months because of the holidays. So pretty cool. Um, you know, I wouldn't have had that if I didn't, you know, use the app. So that's pretty neat. And obviously I have others as well, uh, Apple and um, Chipotle and um, you've got, what is the other one here? Looks like Chewy and uh, some Tesla as well. So pretty interesting stuff. Pretty amazing. I'm obviously interested in continuing to watch this company as they continue to grow. And Rich talks with Aaron about raising capital at a startup and some other tips and tricks as they've, they've learned uh, from just navigating the waters as a startup entrepreneur, uh, you know, based out of Tampa, Florida. But before we get started with the interview, I wanted to invite you all, all of our listeners out there to get involved in not just the start of the year program, but any programs that we're working with. We work with others as well. Uh, if you go to www.establish.us forward slash programs, again, it's www.establish.us forward slash programs on the internet, you should be able to sign up and get notified of the various startup opportunities that are coming across our, our collective desks as we're working with various you know, programs and organizations throughout the year and a number of different ecosystems across the country. So you're going to want to get notified and and be aware of what's going on. So go sign up right away and we'll be, we'll be following up. Also, if you have, uh, if you have some idea or you've got a current company and you want to get a free domain on us or .us on the .us domain, uh, we're actually offering a free domain due to our partnership with .us. So you can go out, simply go to est.us forward slash summit us and register right away. It's uh, thanks to our partnership, as I mentioned, with .us. And you can take uh, what you've got maybe for your current brand and get a shortener, or you can start a new company with, with something on the .us domain. There's a lot of options, and it's free. So check that out. All right, now we're going to listen into Rich's conversation with uh, Aaron Frug from Griffin. Take it away. I'd love to hear, what is the hardest thing about running a startup? I think for me specifically, it's direction. Especially if you're a first-time founder, you're continuously learning every single day. And if you're not willing to learn, kind of get stuck. So right now we are currently at a team of six. And so trying to understand exactly what we should be doing next or what we can be doing next. And you never know what you should be doing. So it's just always trying to be prepared. The, The stress never goes away. It just changes. So I think that is one of the, the biggest things. And it's also just feeling confident that we know where we need to be to be able to raise our next round of funding. Can you give me a specific example about um, why you chose, why you, why you feel that direction is the hardest thing? So I think for example, right now, you know, it, it, it took us a few years to actually build our product out to get SEC approval, to work with the government, all of these different types of things. But we had to speak to 50 different people that just actually understand what we were supposed to do or how to do it. And sometimes there's people who like, they just don't know the answer. So you have to figure it out and just make it up as you go. And now that we are moving on to the next stage of our business and the focus is on, you know, getting users and having them find out about our product, it's spending all of that time focusing on one internalized goal and shifting to something that's external. Now it's, it's, what is, I guess, 
it's just understanding there are so many options out there to get people and to get customers. And so to choose the right one when you have limited money, it's sometimes that it's hard to just make a choice. So I think that it's it's direction is maybe the why behind it is the confidence to make a decision and be okay with that. Um, and like go in some way, like willingness to learn and then switch over to these other things. I, it, the mentality of a startup is it feels like we're always running out of money and we're always just trying to get to the next stage. And if we make the wrong step, it could affect the outcome of us surviving. So it's like, we're always, I guess for me, it's like, we're always at risk. We're always at um, not just, it's trying to make it to the next day. Yeah. yeah. As dark as that sounds. But (laughs) that is a shared reality for sure. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So I totally understand that. You know, what's, um, so uh, there are two pieces there that I want to dig in on, but I'm going to start, I'm going to go back to the first one, which was about um, shifting from external to in or from internal to external. And, you know, that um, scarcity of resources is, is very real. How did you, um, how did you choose, how did you go about picking what direction you're going to go with your external outreach? So we have a business therapist. A business therapist. Yeah. I like it. Me me and my co-founders, we we spend a lot of time so we can figure out how to work together. Because I think that what's unique about our team, where I feel very fortunate, is that we all think in very different ways. Yeah. Which sometimes makes communication a little bit hard. But once you like actually figure it out, everybody like once everyone's aligned it finally gives you like that right answer that you're looking for because it's it's all of that different perspective um but i think it's just like what how we chose to actually go in the direction that we did is it's it's one i spend a lot of time trying to get as much knowledge as possible so i sit down like i have conversations like this maybe six or seven times a day Um, I sit down with different VCs. I sit down with different founders. I sit down with heads of, you know, publicly traded companies. I'll look in different sections, corporate startup um, and venture capital. And then I, I ask them kind of at this stage where we're at, what would you do? What would you recommend? And usually maybe after I'll learn something from every single call, but maybe one call out of 20 is like, okay, that's the nugget of information that I actually need. So it's, it's kind of twofold. It's like the, the information that you learn from other people gives you the direction. But I think the honesty is just actually just doing will give you the direction because the moment that we finally just do, we realize we can immediately realize, okay, this isn't it and switch or change something around or anything kind of of that nature. So sometimes it, it literally is just being willing to take that step forward. Um, yeah it's, that's still a hard thing to do. So most things in life are counterintuitive that I'm learning. Um, and when it comes to startups, that's very true. So it's almost like everything that I would initially think that we should do. Usually it's the opposite, (laughs) (laughs) which is the right thing to do. So that's great. That's funny. So it sounds like you benefited a lot from mentorship. You know, how do you go about finding these folks? That's a lot of, that's a lot of conversations to have. How do you go about finding folks to talk to? mentors to talk to. Let's call them mentors. So when we started this, we, we started this in our last semester of college and there was a, a company called Sharp Spring out in Gainesville, Florida, um, like by the University of Florida, which was like the one publicly traded company there. And I met somebody who introduced me to somebody who worked there and they were like an account executive. Um, and him and I just sat down and I kind of just asked some questions. I was like, look, you've been a part of a company that has grown to this. Um, just tell me about your story, about your life, all of these different types of things. And while this, you know, their role was focused more on the sales side, uh, just having them be a part of an environment and a startup culture, I got to just, for that, this was the first conversation I ever had when we like actually started the business. And like, I met this person and we talked and I learned a lot about them. And then, you know, I told them about our business and they gave us, you know, their input on it. And then they introduced me to somebody else. So like I had one meeting with one account executive locally by my university at a corporate company that had a startup feel to it. 
And then they introduced me to someone else who introduced me to someone else who introduced me to someone else who introduced me to someone else. Um, and like three years later, I've had over 600 meetings. So I think the, the honesty is like everybody knows somebody. And if you enter into a any meeting willing to just build a relationship with nothing else outside of it and to learn, then it, it, it creates more external opportunities. So tell me about the tell me about the most valuable startup event that you've participated in. I'm going to kind of separate into two different categories. Startup of the year was beneficial for our company for a very, very different reason than what most startups would do. So for us, the best places that I have gone to when it comes to conferences is where everybody else isn't. And so, for example, like we ended up going to an ETF conference in Miami and it's a bunch of legacy mindset, investment advisors, all of these types of just like not startups at all, yep. but a lot of the speakers that go there are involved in startup culture and speak at events and are found at all of these other places. So when we're the one startup that's there, when everybody else isn't, it gives us a lot of opportunity to meet people, stand out and, and like kind of give our name. The two things that I would say that, cause we really haven't gone to that many um, otherwise like startup conferences and events and, and, but we, I went to like money 2020, <clears throat> which was fun. I didn't go to a single event. I didn't learn from a single person. All I did was I stood outside and I looked for people who had tags with the words venture on it. And I just yelled at them and like pointed out my hat and asked for 30 seconds. <laughs> so it was like a long trip to Vegas, um, just to do that, which was totally worth it. Um, but I would say that like, you know, when we decided to come to Tampa, Florida, we ended up going to um, uh, the Snaps Conference. That's what it's called, yeah. And what was great about that is like everything else that came with it. So I think it was getting to meet people who just lived in that area and kind of made Tampa feel like home. We built a lot of relationships. It was just a closed community of getting to meet people. So for example, you know, going to startup of the year this year, actually the meetings that y'all set up for us was really helpful because now I'm speaking to somebody. I've had four follow-up meetings with somebody from, you, you guys connected me to somebody from E-Trade Ventures. Um, her and I spoke nothing about E-Trade at all. Well, I mean, that's wrong. We actually did speak a lot about E-Trade, but not E-Trade Ventures in the form of like us doing business together. She was more very educational on like giving us like the B2B side of things and like teaching. Um, I also spoke to somebody else who Thursday, he's actually now in Tampa because of startup of the year. He was from Micro Ventures. Him and I are going to go get coffee. Um, so it's like building relationships that we can have external on, as well as one of my favorite parts was because of like getting to speak to like in front of the judges, that opportunity gives me an open door to then reach out to them on LinkedIn. And so now I'm really good friends with like Cheryl Campos, who like is such a badass. And like, she is now on top of like, Re like Republic and like her and I are having conversations um, and she was super helpful. So it was, I think it's just, it's a, it's a good opportunity to meet people more from a strategic learning and business side, honestly, more than getting our startup name out there. Let's shift gears and talk about and talk about fundraising. Okay. Um, what has been your experience as a company around raising venture capital or around raising capital? Yeah. So for me specifically, yeah. we've been really fortunate that we've raised money now. I think it's from 55 different angel investors from around the country. So out of like all the people that we had those conversations with, um, lucky enough that they actually wanted to be investors. And so what I was kind of telling you earlier, the way that I look at like relationships and meetings that I have, I kind of look at it at three tiers. So the first tier is like just building a relationship with somebody. So no matter what happens, if my only expectation that I go into having a meeting is like building a relationship, that every single meeting I have is a win. Like if I actually try to build a relationship with somebody that will be meaningful. And then second, if I learn something from it, like even better. And then third, if they, if it, we end up doing business together and business in terms of them becoming an investor or us actually like doing business together, even better. So instead of like trying to focus and go into a meeting like where it's intentionally transactional, 
if I can just start off, like I only have a relationship with this person, then I win. Um, and so every single time I think it's just, somebody once told me the rule of zeros. Um, and they said like it for however many zeros you want at the end of a check, you need to have that many meaningful conversations with them. So let's say I want to, you know, get a $20,000 check that's four zeros. So I need to have four meaningful conversations before they would even consider to invest. Some people invest a lot faster, but the average mentality is, is that focus. So I would sit down, no expectations, and just continue to meet with people, continue to learn. They introduce me to others, all of these things. Um, and so it's just, I guess it's volume. I met a lot of people. I learned a lot from them. And then I was just, they ended up reaching out and asking to invest. And so we ended up raising money that way. I would say from a VC side of things, more from the venture capital side, it's a, it's a, it's a completely different animal. Um, it's almost sometimes intentionally transactional, which I'm not too fond of, but I understand the purpose behind it. Um, and so it's, I've learned, don't get me wrong, like I've learned so much from VCs. I'm literally texting a VC right now. Like he's one of my closest friends. Um, but for us, we, we, we've had offers on the table. I would say, I would say things like, you know, the Silicon Valley's of the world, that type of stuff. The valuations are definitely over the top um, and they're too extreme. But then I would say everywhere else in the world, they need to still catch up. So the thing is, is that it's like coming from trying to be a Tampa startup that is consumer focused in a fintech app and a, and a state that is widely B2B and real estate focused. When we get an offer in terms of, you know, from a VC and the terms are incredibly what I would, I feel is predatory to me, that says either two things. One, they're not actually educated on that. That was mean. I did not mean it that way. It's not that they're not educated. It's that it's it's a it's a mindset that is structured around either two things. Because I've heard very very successful people say this. Um, either one, the best part about investing in is that like you get them at a discount. So it's looking at startups outside of these high volume areas as almost second class startups, which I don't think we are or should be considered. Um, or two, it's just a fact of working off of a traditional mindset that, that needs to end up being changed. And so it's, it's just a lot of the time when you ask like, how was raising for us? A lot of time was spent educating and it's, it's having to be at peace with educating. Um, and especially dependent on where you're raising, how you're going about it. So I think the founders need to be the absolute best, not only at what their product is and what they're doing, but also at the other end, they need to be the absolute best at understanding how the system works, understanding what the current state of the system is and being willing to educate people on it and not just assume that they know because then it ends up, you know, it ends up causing issues or, or animosity or things that shouldn't end up being there. Um, expectations lead to failure. So I want to dig in on this. This is definitely, I mean, this is, this is gold. This is a lesson that any startup could benefit from. Um, you know, let's, let's talk real quick about the angel, uh, about the 55 angels. And so yeah. you, you put a, you pulled around, was that from in one round? Um, so our first round we raised, I think it was from like 15 people. So that was like when we were, we were just an idea. Like we were so, we were the first version of our pitch deck. Yeah. Um, so we ended up raising for 15 people there. That was like a, almost a friends and family round on top of just, uh, just building relationships type of thing. So people who am um, just regular angel investors and then the rest of them, um, like the additional 40 people was kind of from that second round. Were you, were these 15 people, were they local or were they from all over? They were from all over actually. Um, but I, I would say majority was from kind of the Florida area. Uh, at the very beginning, probably half or so were from Miami. And did you have did you have an, an, any one angel to step up to lead, quote unquote, whether formally or informally? My entire focus is like in every aspect. All you, all you need is one. The moment that we got one investor, 
that's a signal that allowed other people to be like, okay, this is a real company, you know, even, and that's why I, I was like telling people, like, if you're looking to raise a hundred thousand dollars, even if you get a $10,000 check or $5,000 check or whatever it is, just get one person to believe in what you're doing. Um, and then that's like, then that one person, I think that one person, they wrote us like a $50,000 check. And then we ended up getting $250,000 of extra capital from them just because they started introducing us to all of their friends. And then once they're, if they invest, that's a signal in itself. If they're introducing it to their friends, then their friends don't end up doing the same due diligence. They're basically just like, oh, this person must have already done the diligence. I love the idea. They invested in it. So I'm going to invest in it. Um, so I think, yeah, that was, and then. That makes a ton of sense. And then, and then, so then who wrote yeah. the term sheet for, for each of those rounds? Uh, so we took the safe agreement that was originally from Y Combinator and we took it, we worked with our lawyer and we made it our own. Um, so we, we didn't, and we did a, we did a discount and a valuation cap on top of it. How did you pick that number, those numbers? Cause it, cause a discount, you know, or sorry, a cap is essentially, it's like a, it's like a fake valuation, right? How did you pick those numbers? That, at that point, it's kind of just like intuition. It's, you got it's, it's economics, right? What is the market? So what are people willing to pay for and what are you willing to sell it at? Um, I think that the numbers nowadays are completely different. People are wearing, raising series A at $150 million valuations. It's insane. Um, but it's, it's just the type of thing of it's, how much money do we need and how much are we willing to give up on this stage? Because it's also, you have to think like in the, in the future, there's going to be a series A like VC firm that comes in and says, well, you've already given up too much equity in your company or this has happened. Or and so it's like, you only can really give up a certain percentage each round. You can't, I mean, I'm sure you can change it around, but there's, there's usually a structure that it follows along. So the thing was for us is we originally looked at it and we were like, how much money do we need to raise? Um, and how much are we willing to give up? And would people pay for it at this price? And it's when you're just an idea, it's really hard. Um, but I've also seen on the other end, I've seen people pitch, I'll give up 25% of my company for $150,000. And I'm like, are you actually a venture backable company? Because if you're doing that, you're already shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes is like, how much confidence does the person have in themselves? And to me, that's in, in a different way. So like, you know how we were talking about counter, things are counterintuitive. If I see somebody saying that they're going to give up 25% of their company for $150,000, either I think they're not confident enough in themselves or in the value of what they're bringing to the table, or they actually don't understand how the system works. So it's kind of counterintuitive. If you price yourself too low, people might stay far away um, because it's, it's uh, like, why, why don't they see the value of themselves? And honestly, I need to listen to my own words sometimes, <laughs> but it's and just, I, and I'll, give it's, you, I'll give you, I'll give you the, the, the other extreme of this that's counterintuitive is, is that if you set your target too high, like I'm, I'm going to raise two and a half million, how much do you have committed? I've got, I've got 25,000 committed, you know, right. you're, you're nowhere in the ballpark, right? Right. You know, the yeah. more you set and your target, the easier it's going to be to hit and then to oversubscribe because the target so, is so, number. Right. So I would say even, even that point too, what I, cause I literally just learned this yesterday at that point, that's when you wouldn't say a number. So the thing is, is they would say like, okay, so you're raising two and a half million. Then, you know, even if we, I would say something along the lines of, yeah, we just started a week ago and we already have a committed investor. Beautiful. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that we break, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. It's like, how do you, how do you use that language um, to kind of benefit uh, the, the story they try to put out? But I, I totally agree. There's, there's, it, it, then it becomes strategic though, even in that way of yes, oversubscribing um, works. The question is, though, is that did is the amount now raising also too little? So we ran into another thing where on our seed stage, we knew that we wanted to become a broker and all of these things. So the cost was relatively expensive. And when they actually asked that question, it was expensive. Um, and so but we were trying to do the oversubscribe th 
thing where we set the target lower uh, that actually shot us in the foot too. So we're just trying to figure out, it's such a balance. It's so hard. I think it's just, you just stick with something and you go and you just, you're willing to adjust. Yeah. But like, I, I, I agree with you. It's both sides. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, this is great. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I love that you pulled two rounds together without a formal lead. Um, and I love the, I mean, it's like the, the Aaron, you know, the Aaron Frog Griffin model here is, is that you, um, you network and ask for referrals. You focus on building a relationship as your primary goal. And then every meeting is a win. And then you start to circle up in that first, the first win, the first check is your, is your signal and use that signal to, to light other signal fires. And, uh, and then you set your own terms and bring everybody to the table. We actually ended up raising from a, uh, company without who normally would require a lead and we by building a relationship and working with them for 18 months and them falling in love with our product and the fact that we had so many signals just from different angel investors from successful places all over the place they were willing to just invest on our terms without a lead so just because somebody tells you one thing that doesn't necessarily mean it's true um, and I have gotten that over and over and over and over again. Oh, if yeah. you are a good investment and it's a good company and it's mutually beneficial, things will work out. Aaron, this has been amazing. Uh, such great insight and advice that startup founders, no matter where they're based, they can take this, this the, the, the Griffin pl- uh, you know, fundraising playbook TM uh, and go to market with it. Um, no, this is really um, wonderful advice. I'm so grateful that you'd spend time with us today. Uh, if people want to download Griffin, if they want to get involved with Griffin, if they want to learn more about you, where can people find you and find Griffin on the internet? Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so right now Griffin is available on the app store. So iPad, iPhone, um, anything Apple, just go search us Griffin. It's invest where you shop. Uh, you can find us online at griffin.com or all of our basically social media handles are is just at Griffin app, or you can follow me, Aaron Frug, um, A-A-R-O-N-F-R-O-U-G, Griffin with an one F. Griffin with um, one F. But we would love to, to get people to download the app, hear what their thoughts are and help them actually start investing in like a fun free way. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thanks, Rich. Really enjoyed that story of Griffin and what they've been up to. And obviously we'll continue to watch and cheer for them as they continue to grow. Great stuff for any company out there that's starting up, lots of tidbits to learn. And that's the end of this episode today. Uh, Hopefully you found this episode interesting and your year is off to a good start. And uh, speaking of starting, if you have a startup idea, this is the year to do it. Now is the time to do it. Um, You got to get it going. Remember, today is the best day to start up. And it doesn't mean you have to launch the company, but you could start with just jotting something down on a piece of paper or your notepad on your mobile phone and start iterating on that, talking to a lot of people, trying to figure out what the right fit for this might be, you know, to figure out what the minimal viable product would be. And, but just, you know, get it going. Cause if you sit on it, I think you'll be kicking yourself at the end of the year. So until then I'm Frank until next time, actually, I'm Frank Gruber signing off, stay safe out there and be well. And thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to the startup of the year podcast. Be sure to subscribe and we'll be back with another episode soon.